Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a music teacher with the Manitoba Registered Music Teachers Association. I teach piano and theory and organ. And uh, to contribute to the Canada Music Week celebrations here in Manitoba, uh, we want to take the opportunity to get to know some uh, Manitoba great musicians a little better. And so I'm really thankful to have Matt Schellenberg here uh, to tell us a little bit about himself and uh, his fabulous music. Thank you for talking to us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I really mean it. I, uh, I'm a big fan. That's How are nice. you? How are you doing with the uh, pandemic? Oh, you know, uh, standard disclaimers. Uh, I, I'm i lucky, actually, as far as a career perspective, in that I've had work throughout the whole thing, pretty much. Uh, it's nice. A lot of stuff with, uh, you know, recording uh, it's easy to do remotely, all that kind of stuff. Other than that, you know, just I'm taking it super seriously. I've been kind of living like people did in April this entire time. So I see nobody. Everything's delivered. Uh, I'm making bagels. I'm a cliche. <laughs> but you seem okay. You, you seem to have it all still together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all right. Uh, you know, try try to try to just keep on clinging to whatever. I don't know keep functional. Yeah, that's all we can do, hey? Yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce you just a little bit more. Uh, you're a musician and a composer. Um, Matt is, um, you're probably connected with a few bands, but I want to highlight Royal Canoe, probably my favorite band. I really, really enjoy Royal Canoe, but you also compose for film and, uh, and radio and a number of different media, correct? Yeah, yeah, Royal Canoe is definitely was sort of my, like, bachelor's degree, as it will, <laughs> you know, as you will, like, it's, it's, uh, was my, and, and is still, like, my main project, about 10 years with that band, taught me everything I know, Matt Peters especially, he'd been in bands, he's a little bit older than me, he taught me everything he knows, and, uh, and then, yeah, in addition to that, I, uh, started doing film, radio, and, uh, TV, composition um, I guess maybe about five years ago I think is when I when that started to become my actual income and I did I'm not sure how long it's been since I've had a serving job actually yeah at least five years so yeah. <laughs> um, were you um, a music person since the beginning what did you do as a child Oh yeah, yeah. I started music for young children program when I was three. Wow. Uh, my dad, he he's passed away, but he was a choral conductor for Providence College, and uh, my mom is a kindergarten teacher. She can sing and play piano and all this stuff. So I come, especially my dad's side is a very musical family. We'd like uh, family gatherings, you know, have the hymn sing, and everyone played their instrument. My grandma had like a wine guitar, and my uncle had this. Uh, double bass he'd made out of a hockey stick and a wash tub and a piece of rope that he could like tune just with my like, tension no so way. definitely come from good uh musical genes as far as the show and brick side that's pretty cool um and uh at what point along the way did you start um collaborating with other musicians or, or writing music um i think i i got in grade nine i got excited about like just non-classical music. My piano teacher taught me the blues scale, I think in grade seven, and that got, I, I've always been more of a by-ear musician. I can sight read, but it was always hard for me. And uh, the blues scale, figuring out like that so much of the music that I cared about used the pentatonic and the blues scale. So then I could start to improvise, and then that led me to, you know, I had, we had dial-up internet, so I would Play the guitar constantly while websites were loading, and all things were just all. I'm sure my parents were just terrorized by bad guitar for all of junior high, mm -hmm. and yeah. So I just got interested, and in I started like making tapes. Of really, I wish I could find them. Really bad music in grade nine, and then because uh, I was uh, you know from Steinbach, so there's the all the worship bands and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff that has guitar, and sort of my entry point right. to to the band, as it were. And uh, yeah, and then in high school, I had a band that won the talent show, and then kind of that kept me going to the, the whole thing that uh, and that has got me where I am today, I guess. 
fabulous. Yeah, I think I think all of that is something that students who might be watching can connect to. That music um, can be a family thing. It can also be just like a, a training thing, and it can also be a, a social thing. Um, yeah. And ideally, Definitely. it's all of those and things. They, when they're when they're all of them together, it kind of just I think it it helps to have every aspect of that. I don't know, it just makes it easier to flourish as a musician. Yeah, ideally it's all of the above, right? Yeah. Um, can I ask a little more about Royal Canoe? What is your role in the band? And are you, how much are you a part of writing the pieces? Oh yeah, uh, well we all write in Royal Canoe, so it's, uh, it's definitely a collaborative effort and I play one of the many keyboards, there's seven keyboards. Well, I play three of the, men, of the seven keyboards. And sing, and yeah, I'm, I'm quite involved in the writing. Matt Peters and I uh, do a lot of the lyric writing, along with the rest of the band too. But we do maybe a little bit more of it. And uh, other than that, it's a fully collaborative process with the, the six of us. So. Does it um, do pieces tend to start with kind of a, a kernel, a kernel of an idea, and then days of jamming, or does it sometimes? Um, come we don't there? really do much jamming. We've never succeeded at that. Uh, it's mostly through multi-tracking on a computer. But yeah, it will be definitely a kernel of an idea, like uh, often percussion, often the beat comes first, maybe with one identifying pitch or sample or something that gives it an identity other than just being a drum beat. Yeah. And then from there we sort of build it out. Um, we have a bunch of different hard drives at the space. So this is how we used to work at least. And anyone can come in and just open the session and contribute. Cool. So that's kind of our way of jamming even though there's a couple songs that we've written just a little more through all of us playing in the room, but for the most part, because it's such a calculated kind of stacked pop form that we like to do, it's not as conducive to just whatever you come up with at the time. Because with six different members, you're probably all playing in the same frequency range, trying to play the best hook. And like, it's just, you know, you need some, and sometimes that works, but you need, uh, it's, I find it a lot easier to organize our musical thoughts through uh, multi-tracking. I uh, really like how each uh, song is unique and creative and just like every time really intricate and I wonder if over time playing these songs if if they morph and change or if they really just lock into who they are at the beginning. Yeah they don't really morph and change which is sometimes something we've second guessed because we've played I think I forget how many shows. We have a spreadsheet of all of them. It's in the thousands for sure. And we play the exact same album recording every time. And there's something satisfying in that too. But then sometimes, you know, it's like, I don't know, muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice that we did this uh, Pink Floyd cover show of, uh, of their album. I think it was their Animals album. And, uh, that was totally different. Well, actually, no, we tried to play every note the same as their solos and stuff too, so I guess it wasn't. But like the idea of it, where you have these sprawling solos and you have like all of this improvisation, which, but I mean, I guess that's the ironic thing is that we did exactly what we always do, is just play their improvisation. So. Yeah. Um, that's not all bad. I think I'd be disappointed if, if just even a little, a little glimmer of the piece that I love because everybody probably loves a different element of the song. If it yeah, wasn't there, sometimes it's fun to reinvent. Like we did this project with uh, the Forks and with uh, this guy from Sweden that we did uh, reimagined all of our songs, playing them only with sounds from ice. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah. And that was you know nice because we're playing them in a completely new, different way, mm -hmm. other than just like exactly what the recording was like. So that was really nice. But even then, we you know agreed on exactly what everyone would play in that version and then executed that. Well, for anybody who uh, doesn't know about that show, uh, there was a tremendous element of risk, right? There was a random element there that you had no control about, and that was working with ice. Um, yeah, the, it, the second day it went completely out of tune, and two hours before the show, I was like panicking with a chisel, you know, <laughs> making sure I didn't take off too much so that it doesn't go sharp, and it was, anyway. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. But I think that we publicized it in a way where everyone was on board with like, like taking that risk with us. So we weren't as scared. Like if something went massively wrong, everyone would have understood it. Yeah, but that was exciting. 
um, to know that even you were experiencing those instruments freshly, like they weren't the same pieces of ice that they were at that time, midway through the show, that they were two hours before the show. And yeah. So it was just really, really creative and fabulous. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you should do that every year. Yeah, well, we're looking at, I mean, with COVID, obviously we can't, but we're looking at, uh, the, our agents are pitching the show to, to try it again. Um, maybe in other cities, but, you know, mm -hmm. maybe here again, I'm not even sure. Uh, but yeah, and it's also all on YouTube, too. We have a documentary about it, and the performance is up there, if anyone wasn't there. Yeah, absolutely. I'll include the link to that, and maybe a few other um, examples of your work. Um, I'll tag it onto this interview. Oh, Definitely. great. Cool. Yeah, we'll let people explore what you do. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about your, uh, your film music, and uh, many people have probably heard your, uh, your uh, contributions to CBC programs. Right. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into that? What can you tell us? Uh, really just uh, people taking a risk on me because of Royal Canoe, I think. So um, my the feature film that was really the first time I kind of like went zero to 60 right away. So the, one of the, I mean, I did score some documentaries before that, but the thing that really uh, was this film called Love Sick, which Tyson Karen uh, reached out to me about. He liked my bands and the work that I've done with Begonia and some other things. And he was like writing a story about Winnipeg and he really wanted uh, everyone working on it to be from Winnipeg. And the music was going to be a big part of the film. So he wanted it to come from Winnipeg. And so, just him taking that risk on me really, uh, and then me, you know, managing to do it, uh, got me pretty much the rest of the film work that I've got since then. I think um, because it ended up the the score ended up getting nominated for a, a Canadian Screen Award, and so it got some acclaim, I guess. And yeah, so really just somebody taking a risk, and I guess the club, the Royal Canoe had built, so that they thought that I could do that. And uh, as far as the radio stuff, similar. Uh, I knew um, Ismaila Alpha through the music scene, and he wanted a new team, um, and wanted to reach out to me. He knew about the band. And then when people liked that theme, then I got uh, other jobs as well, and I got to uh, do the theme for Now and Ever and the theme for Information Radio as well. So, um, and that's been great on the radio all the time. I get to hear my little snippets of this and that whenever I'm just like catching the, the news of the day so it's fun. Yeah they're funky it's uh it's great um with uh can you give us just a little uh explanation of how it is to compose for film do you sit there at your keyboard and midi with the film running or what do you do? Yeah yeah depending I mean there's so you get depending on the way they do it sometimes on certain films I've asked to not have them do quite as many um, temp tracks they're called so sometimes you get a film and it's all been edited to a temp track and you know if the temp track is like Beyonce or something it's going to be better than what you make and then so you have to make something worse for them and if they edited to that they like that already you can just get in this cycle of you know obviously you're you know if you put some of the great music part time in there it's going to be you're not going to be able to live up to it so mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes you have that where you're just creating something and sometimes they don't like the temp track for a reason they tell you it's like this is too sad or this is too slow in tempo or whatever so uh, depending on the film and then other times you can get in on the ground level I did a short film called Platypus where I composed the theme before they filmed it for the script and I sort of story actually storyboarded it myself from reading the script and being like I think this is what it's kind of going to look like what do you think about this and uh, that just allowed me to have them edit to my music. Wow. And then it just makes it, um, I don't know, you just can skip that step of being disappointed by something that you're used to. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if it, um, if it probably helps to know the whole story of, of a script before you start writing, because there's a, there's a chance that you're going to want to musically refer to things that haven't happened yet, even at the start, or... Or who knows yeah, what. especially if the music's a big part of it and if they have sort of a theme to the Like in traditional scoring, you know, characters have motifs and there's themes that you use for different emotions that are varying um, on that melody that you created. And that can, 
you know, a bunch of different versions of the same melody. Sometimes, you know, for like really um, art driven films, they really just have the same piece of music that comes up all the time and it gives you, it drills it into you. Uh, for Lovestick, it wasn't that at all. It was like I had to be the music super. So, so in film, you have something called a music supervisor traditionally, which would pull the sort of, uh, it's called sync place music, which would be like a Royal Canoe song, for instance, that or whatever song. And that would probably go in the background of like the dance scene or in playing in the background of the restaurant. But they didn't do any of that. So I made all the music for all of that, including the score, which wow. was, made it really unique. But it had, I was like kind of getting thrown in the fire right away because it was just like, you have to, I made songs with auto tune and like, you know, like kind of classic uh, current rap music at the same time, making like, you know, folk music and all sorts of stuff. So I'm sure wow. that some of that probably, it was, you know, not all of that is my expertise. So you can probably hear some of that, but a lot of it's just in the background anyway. So That's, that's amazing. That's a huge amount of work. And uh, way to go on your accomplishments with that to be recognized for it. And I uh, hope you get lots, lots, lots more gigs with that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about uh, encouraging the students who might watch this video and the music teachers too. Um, what do you think might be missing from the average um, piano or cello or voice students? experience right now how would you encourage them to explore things they might be missing yeah i it guess it's been a while since my formal training i mean i did all the royal conservatory i got my grade two theory i did all the stuff um and i had some really great teachers i think what was frustrating for me at the time is that i wasn't very interested in classical music and i was too young to understand how it was this amazing uh sort of springboard for everything else i cared about but I think that balancing um, a student's needs as far as like what they really makes them passionate and what they just need to know must be sort of the tightrope that people are always walking. And uh, I don't know, you could probably, you know, have lessons that are too much like just learning top 40 pop because that's what a teenager might care about. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you won't be quite as equipped to, you know, know about the circle of fifths that you actually need if you want to be versatile and but then also it could be the opposite too where you're just you know not getting into the ear training and the sort of like curiosity and creativity that can come from improvisation uh so i don't know exactly what might be lacking because i don't know all the specific scenarios but i know that for me i really really appreciated uh learning that blues scale mm -hmm. that was kind of my gateway drug <laughs> Yeah, fabulous. It, um, it sounds like we're on the same page. Nice, rounded education, so you've got all the tools in your belt to uh, go wherever you want, whether that's having fabulous technique or, or the ability to improvise on the fly or, or just a theoretical background so that you know when you're breaking a rule, if and how it's going to work. Yeah, there's this... If you follow on Instagram, there's all these be making hashtags and there's a lot of memes on there and there's all these memes about music theory because beat making is a really, I guess, popular thing to do with your time, which is, you know, anyone can download Fruity Loops and throw in a loop and, uh, but people just don't know their music theory and mm -hmm. they're like, you know, sort of all these memes about just regretting it a bit or how hard it is and uh, in some ways, like, that can offer a fresh perspective because maybe you do something no one would ever think to do because of all the laws in their head. Right. But for the most part, you'll you, maybe you get lucky and do that a couple times and then you're stuck. Right. So I, that, uh, yeah, definitely music theory is something to be careful. I agree. <laughs> um, yeah. It's really great to get to know you a little better and um, to have a chance to just say what you're doing is awesome and keep doing it and thank you for taking the time to to talk to us and encourage the students here and uh maybe inspire them to go outside the box a little bit or, or check out what you've done and try their own hand at it yeah well thanks a lot and i you know say keep at it i get to walk from my bedroom into this room and work and make a living and that's all i have to do and it's great it's a lot of work to get there but you know, it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely.
thank you so much for your time. Please uh, stay healthy and keep making music. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye.